When I was a kid, I dreamed of being an artist. Until one day I saw this interview of, of my favorite cartoonist artist called Sampi, and he was talking about creation. He said, to have a, an idea, it's pretty simple. You need a chair, you sit on it, and then you put your hands like that, <laughs> and you wait. You wait until the idea comes to you. Well, I was horrified. I thought I could never be an artist. I went ahead and studied in film directing, but felt like an imposter most of the time. When years later, I made an encounter that really transformed the way I looked at creation. I had the great luck to work for Robert Lepage, this acclaimed Canadian director. Instead of individual act of introspection, Robert's creations were creative quest, collective quest. Um, in fact, he said that he believed that each time he was starting a new project, being an opera at the Met or an original play, he believed that the show already existed, that you only have to look for it. He said that if you trust your team and you pay attention to what's already there, what's the theme, the show will reveal itself. Well, I was sure hoping that was true when years later I was directing a project on my own in a total different context in a format that had never been done before. Even at the hardest point of the process, I always thought that if I paid attention, the experience would reveal itself. So I work at Moment Factory, and together with this amazing team, we created a night walk experience in the forest. Even in our wildest imagination, neither the client or Moment Factory had imagined what this project would bring to us. We had no idea that this was the beginning of something great. The famous poet Mary Oliver gave those instructions for life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. It seems so simple and obvious if you start a journey or a new project to do that, pay attention. But in our times, pretty self-centered times, observing, listening, and not commenting, it actually takes intention. So I want to tell you how we apply the instructions of Mary Oliver and Robert Lepage to this process of creating Foresta Lumina. A year before opening, I thought the creative process would go just like that, smooth, where in fact it went like that. It's nice when the line goes up and you progress and things are happening, but it, it's actually in the unexpected curves and the twists that we learn the most and make the best discoveries. So a year before opening, I had been working at Moment Factory for a while, doing different installation in public spaces or theater. When this client came to us, which was pretty different, it was a park, and they had this big forest, a bridge near a little town. They had hikers during the day, and they wanted to offer something at night to keep the, those visitors at their camping. So they thought a video projection on the bridge would do the trick. The forest. We were so excited at the office. Can you imagine having that forest as a canvas? This dark and mysterious place that had made the human imagination go crazy since the beginning of time. So we were like kids in a candy store and it didn't take long that we were there. We saw their bridge and it was fine, but it's, it's not what sparked our imagination. We walk a path of two kilometers, and along that path, we saw amazing areas that were evoking different kinds of emotions. I want to bring you on to that, because, of course, the first reflection is that we had to use all of that for that experience. Let me show you the space. When you came in, there was this grand open space. It felt like a hall of a big uh, theater, and we thought that would be great to get this sense of discovery and having people stepping as if they were stepping in a fairy tale book. 
Uh, then the path was getting very different. The, the forest was closing on you, so we thought, oh, this would be the perfect place for more intrigue, more mystery. Then we found this bridge, and of course we imagine already a portal, a, a passage between the real world and the imaginary world. Following the bridge, there was this natural amphitheater, like a natural stage uh, with great depth uh, that Clearing was offering. So I could already imagine with transparent uh, projection, I could fake, I could give the idea that someone is really walking on that mound. So I thought that this would be a great area for more drama. And the woods were totally different. Huge trees, uh, skylight was not entering. It was already scary during the day. So I could only imagine with some multimedia how it could get. <laughs> and it led to a beautiful ending where uh, this riverbank was just wonderful uh, nature during the day. So uh, I thought that our, I could already feel this kind of sense of, of wonder, of release of tension for the end of the experience. So I looked into the different emotion that evoke each of those areas, and it reminded me of something. It reminded me of the three acts story structure, which is a very common tool uh, used by all storytellers doing uh, movies, books, or ads. Uh, you'll find them in, you find that structure in Greek mythology as well as the last, last blockbuster, which is this idea of setting up the tone and having a raise of tension with the confrontation goes to a climax and then falls of tension with a resolution at the end. And so I could associate those feelings to the path. And so I thought that people walking the path could get the same feeling as a good book or a good movie. So the path the path had a natural rhythm, and as our canvas, we paid attention to it. We respected the narrative flow that was embedded into it, and it became the base of our work. So we thought, okay, we have zones, we have emotions that we want to bring with each of those zones. Now, how are we going to make the audience feel it? And we thought that characters could draw it out. And that's when we, thought we start paying attention to history to get inspired from the, for the characters. Um, Quebec province used to be a very Catholic place, and it was a tradition to, for each village to raise and build this huge cross on the highest mound around the village. Uh, so Quaticook is no different, and there was one cross in the clearings in one of the zones. For me, it felt like a great opportunity to talk about the devil. The devil... <laughs> the devil is the most common figure you find in Quebec legends. He's always shown as this gentleman, stranger, coming to the little town to rob the soul of the best-looking women, or to make you miserable if you work on a Sunday. <laughs> of course, if you think about it, those stories were used a lot by the church long time ago to have people make lots of kids work very hard and go to church every Sunday. So I thought it would be pretty interesting to bring those two together. So that was a take on modern uh, heritage and history. Now I was thinking about older times, who had stepped foot in that territory? Who was, on the, who was in the, those, those woods? And it was the Abenaki nation that used to live in that territory. And we start looking into uh, their legends. And uh, we found something interesting, like their version of the boogeyman. They for sure use that story to have their kids go to sleep at night. Um, so most of the nation in Canada have their version of the Wendigo, this man turned giant at night who is hungry for human flesh. Um, well, the, the version of the Abenaki was called the Jiwakwa, and we were inspired from it to create our own creature. That would do the trick for the most scary part of the path. 
So just like that, we created seven characters that were inspired by the, the folklore of the region. And so that was one big step forward. And at this point, we were ready to show to the client what we've got. And this was the middle, the middle beginning of the process. And uh, I was pretty nervous because they had come to us for a mapping projection show. They wanted a video projection and we were offering them a night walk multimedia that we couldn't compare to anything else in the world. But they say yes, they loved it. So she said, okay, let's go for it. I'm gonna go and raise money for it. Now I can't wait to know more. And I was like, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and this when it hit, I had no idea how those uh, characters would be shown, what would be the story. I didn't know. And then I get news on the technical side. I learned that those little details, I don't know if you know, wind, cold, rain, uh, well, uh, it cost the double to install technology outdoor. So out of the five projectors or many video projectors I had in mind to tell my story, I could use only two. And this when it, the line started going backward. <clears throat> so with that limitation, we had to be very creative of finding a way of incarnating those characters. Could we use only light and sound for some of them. So looking at the thunder, for example, one of the characters, because the region gets flooded all the time, so that character made sense. We, if you look at the lightning and this multiplicity of line, we thought perhaps lead bars could do the trick. And with great sound, this zone could become something very sensorial. We could get the sensorial thunder instead. And then the fairies. I always have this uh, memory of the fairies in Fantasia that look like little fireflies. So then I thought if I use pixels and music and have those pixel uh, singing to us, it might be as enchanting as I had uh, envisioned at first. And our world was really taking shape. There was a great path where characters would be revealed all along the way, but I felt something was missing. I didn't know. And then I thought, who cares if there's a wolf, a grandma, and a hunter, but no little red riding hood, right? I was missing a main character, something that would draw a trend to all of this world. And so I dived into uh, the legends of Quebec again and realized that, I realized that uh, most legends were about men. And I thought, well, what about women? If you think about that, 80 years ago in a rural area of Quebec, um, a woman would be, pass most of the year by herself. A lot of men would be logging up north. So, at 25, she might have already many kids and she may you know, take care of a house all by herself with no electricity under five feet of snow. Well, that sounds like courageous and fierce being to me. And that's exactly what I needed to go walk in the forest to meet all those seven magical characters. So those women um, of the older time in rural Quebec was in, were the inspiration for Margaret. In the process, there were still a few twists and shifts and curves, but it gives you an idea. And I wanna bring you to the opening night. In the sky, it, there was a full moon just on the opening night, exactly where I would have painted if I could. So I thought that was a good sign. Let me show you how it looked like.
the client was expecting. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That summer, the client was expecting 7,000 people to come and visit. In fact, 70,000 came. The year after, the double. But it's really when we start getting the feedback a few days and week after the opening that we realize that we tapped into something meaningful. We heard from this dad who, for the first time, felt so connected to his autistic son. We heard from this family of four that experienced the night magically drama-free. Can imagine I have two kids with four kids. <laughs> so we have many different comments, and then we see the town transforming with the, with the Foresta Lumina. More uh, people in town, so restaurants are opening, motels are getting bigger, the economy is booming. On our side, the Moment Factory, never a project before had brought so many calls. People from all over the world, organization, asking about those magical forests, being interested about it. That, we did it again and created a series called Lumina. There are now nine different Luminas all over the world, two in Japan, one in Singapore. Our team has grown, many different directors work on those different shows, and they are all inspired by their own location. We realize that letting people step out of the reality and into a magical world was a powerful experience. It made people feel alive. It made them feel connected to a place. And all of this started by paying attention to what was in those woods of Quetzalcook, because Foresta Lumina was already there. So in the future, I think the words of Mary Oliver will never get grow old for me. I will pay attention, I will be astonished, and I will tell about it. Thank you.